Hello, my Juicy Co-Creators. Lilu here in Boston with Dr. Alan Hunter. Finally. <laughs> Lovely to see you. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for inviting me in your home. And it's much, much better, much more intimate than over Skype, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> Skype is wonderful, but this, this is the real conversation. Yes, I'm this so is it. And I have a hard time to keep up with all the books that you write because you write so many of them and I had wonderful conversations with you about the the Grimm's and how actually Disney turned those those stories a little bit around. Can you tell us just for a little bit, a little snippet of that because I want to mainly go today into the path of Synchronicities, which is your latest book, and I'm experiencing so many synchronicities, oh, and good. all the beautiful co-creators are that we want to put words on this and understand a little bit better what blocks the flow and what is actually the synchronicity and what does that lead us to. But tell us about the, the those stories, the Grimms yes, that you've been the, passionate about for a long time. Yes, well, the uh, the Grimm brothers stories, uh, the Grimm brothers tales, which everyone thinks they know. Um, it turns out, no, not many people really know what the Grimm brothers wrote. They only know what Disney did with the stories and this came to me in a in in a form of synchronicity because I was talking to uh, actually a group of women about one of my other books uh, and they were looking for happiness and success in love and one of them said oh you know you have to kiss a lot of frogs and I said wait a second I said where did you get that idea Oh, it's the, the Grimm Brothers fairy tales. I said, no, if you go to the Grimm Brothers actual tale, there is no kissing of frogs. And that set off a whole series of alarm bells in uh, some of the people. Said, no kissing of frogs? You mean we don't have to put up with all these frogs in our lives? <laughs> I said, yeah, read the story. The princess does not put up with the frog. She demands he changes, and then he turns into a prince. She actually throws the frog. Throws him. She picks him up and says, she's going to, and she throws him against a wall to kill him. In other words, we'll only get people to change when we demand they change. And if we're just content to go around kissing frogs, guess what we're going to do? Mm -hmm. We're going to kiss a lot of those funny amphibians, yes. which is fine if you like that kind of yes. thing. But we have to honor ourselves first, and that's really what, Dis what the Grimm's were about, and Disney turned this around. Precisely. So the whole book was looking at the Grimm brothers' tales and saying, Disney changed these for a reason to sell nice stories that nobody could object to, and that goes for Cinderella, that goes for um, the Frog Prince, that goes for uh, any of those famous Dis Snow White that we think, everyone thinks they know Snow White. Mm -hmm. If you read this book, you'll see that the real story is much deeper, much more powerful, much more emotionally effective, and it will show us how to live full lives. Whereas if we go and watch the Disney version on the screen, um, we'll have a lovely time with seven-year-olds, but we won't learn very much that will feed our souls. So that came to me as a piece of synchronicity because enough people asked me about these things that I said, oh, the universe is nudging me saying, you maybe want to do something with this. And God bless Disney, everybody yes. loves it, but, and, and many people take their children to Disney World and it's all wonderful and very happy, but those stories, the Grimm Brothers tales, they were written not just for seven-year-olds and five-year-olds, they were written for people of all ages, mostly for grown-ups, as real, genuine spiritual guidance. And then that was it at the time? That was it. That you either had the Bible mm -hmm. or you had the Grimm Brothers. Uh -huh. And the Grimm brothers were stories that were told. They were orally related around the fire, fireside, um, in cottages. So you had the Bible for your, your how, to, how to live according to the laws of the land, and you had the Grimm brothers telling you how to select uh, a spouse who is good for you, how to deal with injustice, how to live within a community mm. on a day-to-day -day basis. It feels to me like this whole the whole Disney and how it's, it's been shifting from the Grimm's the Grimm brothers to the Disney is kind of what we're living in our society, isn't it? Yes, you're absolutely right. I'm afraid our society has never yet missed an opportunity to take something and turn it into money. And 
nothing wrong with making money, but there is something wrong with taking a very good, powerful, wonderful story and taking out everything that is nourishing for our souls in it. And this has perhaps been my life, um, one of my life tasks in my, my book, Stories We Need to Know. I say, there is wisdom in these stories, profound wisdom, if we know it. If we don't know the story, we can't get the wisdom. Of course we can't. And if we rely on an advertising agency or, or, um, or a multinational corporation that wants to make money, if we rely on them for wisdom, we're not going to get very much wisdom. Mm. I'm sorry. Yes. But, it, but the good news is that it's really up to us to now open up to the synchronicities, to open up to something bigger than ourselves, to start living our truth and not the truth from the magazines and the media and, and the, the movies that are great. But now it's time to move forward with something bigger and the living from the heart, from trusting ourselves. How beautifully you put it. It is now the time for us to move out of the realm of commercialism and start living genuinely from the heart and from the spirit. Yeah. And that requires a shift from materialism, oh, what can I get and how can I look good, to what does it actually mean to be alive here, now, mm. listening to our lives, feeling our lives, being ourselves, rather than what the advertisements tell us. People have been talking about this for, for several decades, yeah. but now it seems to me there is a real flow of energy where people are saying we want something else mm -hmm. where can we find it mm. and so that's what I hope to be a part of in every book that I write uh, so would you say that the path of synchronicity the title of your latest book is really this path of a flow of greatness of of magic <laughs> well again you put it beautifully because what I say in the path of synchronicity is that um, it's not about living is not about how many toys we can amass or about how much money we can make instead I suggest in the book that the universe is constantly <clears throat> giving us hints and pushing us gently to recognize things we can choose not to do anything we can choose not to recognize what the universe is sending us mm -hmm. but if we listen we'll realize it's asking us again and again who are you really what do you have that is yours and Lulu nobody knows this better than you <laughs> because you've been on this path what do you have that is essentially yours and then the question is how are you going to use it for the good of everyone not just for ah, making me rich and famous, but how can your talents, everyone's talents, yes. each of our talents, best be used? Because we all have different talents, mm -hmm. and some of them may not be very well paid by the world, and some of them may be paid enormously well. That doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What matters is that we are contributing, because the universe doesn't have hands and feet and, and lips. The universe has us. And our job is to listen and say, what is it the universe needs me to do with my life? Um, can I give you an example? Bring it on. Okay. <laughs> well, there are many examples. I learned this one personally when I, I, stopped, um, I stopped trying to do things just for me, and I started thinking about where I needed to be to fit into the universe. But my favorite example, well, two favorite examples, of course, John Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy said famously, ask not what uh, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Mm. Wonderful political line. Uh, but he meant it, I think. And one of my great heroes, John Steinbeck, the, the writer, Nobel Prize winning writer, mm. um, he is a wonderful example of this because he knew he was going to be a writer. And he said, OK, I'm going to do my market research. And my market research says that what people want is historical novels set in France in the 17th century. So he wrote these huge novels. Nobody wanted them. He wrote four huge novels. Nobody wanted them. And the story goes that after he'd finished the, the fourth one, he went out on the town for a, a relaxing 
few drinks. And when he came back, he'd forgotten to leave any food for his dog, and his dog had eaten his novel. <laughs> yeah, that's the story. I don't know whether it's true or not. But nobody wanted these, um, these huge books that John Steinbeck was writing. And eventually he said, this is useless. I'm going to write about what's right in front of me, right here on my doorstep today. And he looked outside and he saw the poor people of California. He saw the poor people of Salinas and he said, I'll write about them. And when he wrote about them, the publishers took one look and said, this is the real thing. This is coming from the heart. This is something we need to know. And he never, never had a problem publishing after that. And he kept championing the, pure, the, the poor. I mean, the Oklahoma Dust Bowl in, in The Grapes of Wrath. He is the documenter of that. And he helped not just himself, but he helped a whole generation of displaced people. And he helped a whole generation of people who couldn't understand why these Okies were coming to California and, and living in encampments and trying to... And, and, and they were afraid of them. John Steinbeck helped the Depression generation to come to terms with itself. I think he... Without him, the, the um, political policies, which eventually allowed um, for uh, the unemployed to be, to be employed in, in projects of the infrastructure around this country, that could never have happened. You see the difference? When he stopped doing what he thought would be good for him yes. and started doing what felt real, yes. the whole world changed. His world, our world. So it's really the path of the heart, huh? The path of the heart. If we follow the path of our hearts, we'll find ourselves in that flow. And when we're in that flow, we, don't, we, we can't stop thinking and we can't stop working. Steinbeck didn't stop working. But when we're in that place and we listen and we say, what's the best way to use my energy now? What's the best way to, to address these problems today? And that's when we're in the flow. The universe will keep giving us hints. Doors will open where no doors had opened before. And suddenly, in a sense, we know we're on the right track because it brings us joy. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken to so many people who have labored and labored and then they've found their groove, their flow, their path. And I say, how do you know you're, how do you know you're on the right path? And they all, they, they all say, it makes me happy, mm -hmm. it gives me joy, or I get up in every day and I want to do this. And I say, good, you've found the way of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. Emotions are very good at letting us know what we need to know. So how would you define synchronicities? Okay, synchronicities are those moments when um, things which had seemed impossible become almost miraculously possible because you've stopped seeing them as barriers. So, for an example, um, uh, every, every teenager, perhaps, has had the experience of a parent saying, you can't study that because I want you to be this, 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 or you can't do that sport. Because and the opportunity there is twofold. One can fight against it. Fight, 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 fight. I'm not going to do this. <laughs> okay? And that's an opposition, and not much can get very far that way. A different way is to say, okay... I'm going to do this, but I'm going to keep my ears open. And as I am doing this sport or this study, I'm going to find out what it has to tell me about who I genuinely am. And sometimes it may tell you genuinely, you're no good at this, mm -hmm. don't do it. But that's information. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it says, hey, you're not that good at this, but over here is something important. Um, I'll give you an example there as well. Uh, a radio interviewer the other day, um, uh, two, there were two people, a man and a woman, and they both said, oh, we're really excited about synchronicity. And I said, oh, how is that? And the man said, well, I thought I was going to be in television until one day I got the opportunity to come to a radio station, and he said, and since then I've never looked back. And I said, well, you can call that dumb luck, or you could say, you responded to a synchronous moment and said, ah, it's not about where I think I'm going, it's where the universe is telling me you'd be better here. Mm -hmm. 
And he said, yes, that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And I, I give you that example because that's happened to me so often mm -hmm. when I've talked about people, when I've talked, well, talking to you, Lilu. I mean, you had many, many jobs before you came here to doing this. Mm -hmm. And this is what, this is one of the things you're supremely good at. But you didn't start doing this. Mm -hmm. You started in, in software, I think, didn't mm -hmm. you? So we take, it takes us a while to get where we need to go. And mm -hmm. you lost your job and you loved it, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. That's the title of your book. Yes. Because that was a synchronous moment. Yes. I lost my job. Oh, no! Or is it, I lost my job. This is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Mm -hmm. My goodness, yes. yes. And yet it feels like when we're stepping in that zone, uh, when we have the, 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 the courage, I would say, to live that flow, to live that divine path, yep. um, there is some healing there that needs to take place. The, the real work starts there, really. It's liberating, but at the same time, we're facing huge, uh, it could be huge challenges sometimes to reorganize things, because our life could be far away from actually that flow, that real flow. Yes. So how do we deal with that? Is there something? Because that could easily block the flow and that could easily uh, not, we feel off path and we have one foot in, one foot out. One foot it's in. quite an interesting <laughs> concoction right there. <laughs> well, that's, that's exactly it, which is what I write about in, in the book, of course. I talk about the barriers to synchronicity. There are always going to be barriers. Um, and some of them are going to be loving barriers. You might have a parent or a sibling or a loved one who says, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. We need you to, you, or a friend who says, oh, if you do that, I, I, we, you know, I won't see you. We can't be friends. And, you know, that's a very powerful thing. And sometimes we have to work out a compromise. But there is such a thing as loving tyranny. And love can be tyrannous because some of our friends want us to stay the same because they're afraid to live their lives without us. Mm -hmm. And so when this happens, we think, oh, oh, I, I can't leave my neighborhood, my, my, my community, my, my church, my, I can't do this. The question is, it's, it's not an either or. It's not you have to do this, you have to do that. The question is, this is an opportunity for more love. So talk to your, your family, your friends, your community, your, your, your church and say, I feel called to go in this direction. Can we talk about what that means? And what we'll find is that we recognize the extent that we love people and they uh, recognize the extent that they love us. And we come to an understanding that in order to be loving, we have to be hands off. It's not conditional love. I'll only love you if you're here. It's a case of, hey, whatever you do is whatever you have to do. Mm -hmm. And that bond won't break. Mm -hmm. And so this is, uh, it's, it's not a, like a switch, either on or off. Mm -hmm. It is a real opportunity, again, to grow more love. And I, I, w when we have... You can't grow enough of love. <laughs> enough of it. I mean, every challenge that comes our way, even ridiculous things like uh, someone who's rude to you in a, in a shop, you can respond by being rude back or you can say, okay, this is actually an opportunity if I can. <gasps> yeah. And it's an opportunity to grow more understanding or just allow people to be where they are, which is another way of showing love and respect. So this is about synchronicity, about listening to the moment, about being in the moment, rather than saying, I have a vision which is going to be exactly what it is, and it's got to be this or nothing. Like John Steinbeck, you may want to be a writer, but the universe may want you to be a writer of this kind rather than what you thought you were going to be. In which case, listen, listen, listen. Mm. So... Uh, it's more about letting things come to us rather than pursuing them? Well, it's, it's both. Um, if we don't listen, we won't see opportunities. Mm -hmm. And if we don't see opportunities, we can't pursue them. But we can't sit there and be st passive and say, everything will come to me, uh, you know. <laughs> 
it's not going to happen that way. And the, the examples I give are, you know, when we're born, uh, we, we emerge, we're born, you know. And the first thing that happens is we get slapped on the backside to make us breathe. <gasps> And the lesson is clear. Mm -hmm. You're in the world, you've been given life, but you have to be a co-creator. Mm -hmm. You have to gulp the air <gasps> and start breathing. Otherwise, you'll be dead very quickly. That's the first lesson, and it's a big lesson. It's a spiritual lesson as well as a physical lesson. The second lesson the baby learns is, you know, food, which has come through the umbilical cord, so it's all been magically right there. The second lesson the baby learns is, I've got to... <laughs> I've got to take food, and I've got to suck, otherwise it won't do me any good. And it's as though the world, the universe is saying, here is all this good stuff, are you going to respond? Are you going to do your part? Mm -hmm. And that's the same with synchronicity. We get these opportunities, are we going to respond, or are we just going to say, eh, I don't think so, it's not perfect. Out there in the world, there are, ooh, let's see, the population of the United States is about 350 million, so there are probably about 250 million people who are waiting, waiting, waiting for the big break when everything will change. Not many people will get that big break. They won't magically become film stars. They won't magically win the lottery. But there are millions of little, little breaks and if we listen for them, they will lead us step by step, by, and then they will get bigger. Mm -hmm. And because the universe tests us. Mm -hmm. The universe needs us to be the strongest we can be, and it's going to test us. It's going to say, hey, you still there? You, you still paying attention? You still thinking? Or have you gone to sleep again? Nudge, nudge. And so the little steps will lead us to, really, when, when you see some people, like, say, Oprah, who, I mean, she took these little steps uh, and they led to bigger steps and finally she, she said, this is incredible, I don't know how this happened. It happened because she listened mm -hmm. and she made decisions and she worked hard. Yeah. You know, she started as a weather broadcaster mm -hmm. and you think, how many weather broadcasters have I seen and forgotten? Mm -hmm. But something about her, someone said, oh, she's good. Um, here's an opportunity. And the doors started to open. Yes. And, and it was out of a failure of hers, out of being a, then a, a journalist or a news broadcaster after doing the weather, I think, right. that then she screwed it up. Yeah. <laughs> and then she found out that there was so much more to her than, than, than reciting or reading. Yes, yes. It was not real. It didn't feel real to her. Yeah. And so failure is a huge component. Is, is that what you found out too throughout your own tribulations? And yes. Um, failure is a huge component. I myself have failed uh, at at least one job. Um, and I was so eager to succeed at that job that it nearly killed me. Mm -hmm. um, because I kept going back saying, oh, I, I can do better this time. And actually my ego and my pride... Um, were working against me. And when I said, okay, I can't do this. This is really not where I need to be. That was a major humbling moment. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to change my entire mindset and say, okay, what is it I can do? What is it that I'm good at? What is it I can grow? And in the book, I talk about uh, how this is reflected in literature. Um, one of the great pieces of, uh, of literature in the last 1,500 years um, has been Dante's Divine Comedy, which everyone knows but nobody reads. Mm -hmm. It's a great pity. And in that, Dante uh, literally goes to hell. He travels through hell and he sees all these sinners suffering. And you think, well, this is all very Christian mumbo-jumbo. But if we look at it from a slight distance, we can see this as as a story that is a metaphor, and that is each of us has to visit hell, to see our limits, our failures, see how we can mess up badly, so that we can know ourselves better. Mm -hmm. And then when we know ourselves better, then we can move forward. Mm -hmm. 
And when we start moving forward, that's when synchronicity kicks in. Yeah. So we have to wrestle with our demons, with our shadow. I spend quite a lot of time talking about the shadow. Mm -hmm that part of ourselves that really, really wants to be someone. <laughs> and we have to wrestle with it and say, no, you, the shadow, the ego-driven, power-hungry, that nasty part of ourselves, because it, it turns nasty, it will yeah, turn oh, nasty. Yeah. We have to wrestle that and say, I'm bigger than you are. We're going to use you, we're going to use your energy when we need you. But for now, thanks very much you're not in charge and this is a major major turning point for for most people now I know Lulu I mean I've listened to your videos I've seen your videos your interviews and you interview wonderful people who have had near-death experiences who have uh, been to extraordinary extremes and it has changed them oh, yeah. it has changed them profoundly mm -hmm. Yes. And it seems like in that moment of being on our knees, um, and some people go all the way to the dark night of the soul, as Carolyn Mace explained, her own dark night of the soul in an interview I just did with her, but really being on the knees is such a humbling moment and just I'd, I'd, in that space I personally was just praying yeah. and asking for help and I think I think we need to be in that place and get to that place where we really understand that there's so much more than us and we're not that much in charge and what a wonderful feeling to have faith faith is the name of the game isn't it I Part of so. the game. <laughs> yes, I mean, faith is a word that some people associate with a particular religion. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, it's, it's a loaded word. But faith is a very good word to use because you just have to, in a sense, have trust. Trust. And yeah. say, mm -hmm. all right, I'm part of something bigger. I'm a little part of something bigger. What is it? Where am I being led? And, and when that happens, the... the, the um, dangerous moments, the moments when you touch the, the, the pit of despair, that lets you know that's the limit, and now you can come back. And then you can do, we can all do what is required of us. Mohandas Gandhi would said it to, to the millions of uh, people who supported him in India. He said to them, he said, um, it may seem to you that nothing you can do can change the world he said but he said it is vitally important that you continue to do it in other words we might not all be heroes we might not all appear on the cover of life magazine or newsweek or whatever and frankly who cares but we have a role and when we find that role it's up to us to do it absolutely fully and with love and that's when the synchronicity happens yeah. for everyone, for everyone. And it's important to step two, two feet in, because I've never felt that many synchronicities since the tour has started. And that's when the full journey really yeah. started. And then it's just everything supported. It's hard to even go away from it. Huh? That path is that's quite right. a, a pretty, it is not narrow, but it is quite defined. It's hard to get away from it once we're on it. <laughs> You're not supposed to get away from it. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes, you know. Sometimes, sometimes we want to. Yeah. Said, no, there's no wondering here, really. I mean, there is wondering, and but everything is purposely put into place. It is. It is. <laughs> and sometimes there are there are temptations as well. <laughs> I mean, uh, for every one person who has wonderful talent, there must be fifteen who have taken the temptation and sold out in mm -hmm. some way and, and taken the money. And we see that in po politicians especially. Mm -hmm. They may start and they're full of enthusiasm and idealism and, and maybe they believe half the things they say and then as the temptations mount up there, there is a tendency for some of those politicians in other countries and in this country to look after their own interests. They do it for the job for their own preferment for the money. Mm -hmm. There was a big scandal in England uh, recently where it was discovered that almost all the politicians in the British Houses of Parliament were using their expenses mm -hmm. to pad their pay package. Mm -hmm. And everybody said, oh, but we've done this for years. And that's where the idealism gets lost. 
And we've got the same thing in the United States at the moment with the two parties butting heads. They've stopped thinking about what their job is and they've started thinking about the party line, about how to stay in power rather than about how to do the right thing. And the same is true for me, for you, for, for anybody. And as you say, when we, when we dive in completely, when we make the jump with both feet, when we say, okay, leaving that behind, here I go, that's when we give the universe the chance to send us what we need. Mm -hmm. It tests our courage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'm glad that you put that piece too in place because it is a, it is a world right now that is mainly governed by power and money. Mm -hmm. And so it is easily, there's a lot of corruption. Yeah. There is a lot of false message. There is a lot of um, information that is going out there that is not the truth. And only And that's how I started on this journey, really, just wanting to put out information like this. This is really the information that should be out, uh, or, or at least part of the information that could be out f to inspire people for our own, for t to develop, to open up our potential and our heart. And um, that's really what I feel your message is today, is that we are, as Gandhi said, we're the change. We are the change. Each of us has a, has a, has a role to play, huh? Each of us, absolutely. And and there is no role too exalted or too humble. Yeah. We are e we are each to do as we should. Yes. So the only difference between exalted and humble is that some jobs get paid better, so we get a bigger pile of green yeah. pieces of paper. But it doesn't mean they're more valuable. No. I know teachers and um, nursery school attendants uh, who are paid very little. But the job they're doing is wonderful. These young lives they are nurturing and bringing forward. By any rights, they should be well compensated. Yes. Instead of which, their real magic is taken for granted. It's still magic, though. Yes. And we, when we operate from the heart, uh, we can really appreciate that and perhaps help to change things. I would love to see our government spend a lot more on nurturing its young people than it does on putting them in prison. It, I've worked in prisons, and there are some people who deserve to be there. But I also know some of those people, if they had been given the opportunity to grow up in a dignified way when little, wouldn't be in prison. But we don't do that. We live by money and power and politics and what keeps... Mm -hmm. those folks in the positions that they feel so comfortable in and so we we waste our human resources and that's a that's a terrible thing that breaks anybody's heart mm -hmm. and it is our hand to make that choice we can make that choice yes. you you um, teach at university here I do, yes. literature yes I <laughs> teach literature I teach exactly what we're talking about but yes. I I have to teach it in terms of literature and it's all the way through literature every every piece of literature that is is good and great mm -hmm. is involved with the human values and the values of the heart and how to be authentic every single piece mm -hmm. anything that isn't tends to last for a few days and then disappear but Real literature feeds us mm -hmm. and lets us know what's important. Can you give us an example of one of those heroes in literature <laughs> that really, truly lived the path of the heart? Oh, well, there are so many. Um, uh, possibly that, that really touched you. Okay. Um, there are <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a great fan of Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there have been some wonderful movies of Jane Austen uh, recently. And in every single one of those movies, I'm thinking of Pride and Prejudice, for instance, or Emma, Gwyneth Paltrow was uh, in, in that. Um, what happens to the hero and the heroine, but particularly to the heroine, is that she is asked to listen to what is really true of the heart, rather than what she thinks she ought to be doing, given her status her social situation, and indeed her pride. Mm -hmm. And in every case she's humbled, just a little bit, and in every case she learns a new language. And that's really important. Now I'm also a great fan of Harry Potter, mm -hmm. uh, because we've spoken about Harry Potter. And uh, Harry Potter, the, the same thing is true. Um, he has to learn who he is. Now he's got this scar on his forehead, and everyone thinks, oh, he's going to be a great wizard. 
Well, he turns out to be kind of a not very good student and not really very good at his books, and um, he's a disappointment to his professors. But what he discovers is he's got the heart of a lion, <laughs> or the heart of, a, of, a, of a, something even larger than a lion, <laughs> I don't know. And when he lives from that space, he's absolutely unbeatable. And what helps him live from that space? All his friends. He has, you know, Hermione and um, um, uh, his little buddy there, um, Rupert Grint, um, and their families, and they provide a community so he can find out this little lost orphan. He can really find out who he is. Yeah. And so he's not good at the books. He doesn't beat himself up over it. So he's fairly good at sports, but that's not the core of who he is. The core of who he is is a person who loves others. Mm -hmm. And right at the end, of course, of the Harry Potter series, and a spoiler alert if you haven't read book seven or seen the movie, um, but right at the end, he is given the ultimate choice, and that is um, you can walk away and be alive, or you can do what you have to do, in which case, risk death. And it's a poignant moment. There he is, 18 or 19 years old, and he says, I have to do the danger. I have to go the dangerous route. I can't go the safe route. And that's exactly, of course, what Joseph Campbell always said. You know, the safe route is never the safe route. And he goes the dangerous route, the route of the heart. Yeah. But ultimately, that's the only game in town. Everything else, <laughs> not worth thinking about. So what would you think the most important question is? The most important question is in terms of synchronicity? Oh, in our lives that we should ask ourselves. Oh. The most important question we should ask, and perhaps ask every day, is who am I in my heart? And how can I show, more, how can I show and grow more love? Who am I? Because if I'm true to who I am, and, and that doesn't, you know, that can change. Who I am today is maybe not the same as who I was three years ago or two weeks ago. Who am I today and how can I live from my loving center? And that's a tough one because we meet the same people sometimes, the same grumpy people, and we, we respond out of habit, being grumpy back. It's a tough game, but if we can live from that space... Voila! Ta-da! That, that, that's, that's the name. And the, the light is on. <laughs> and the light is on. And everything becomes a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. You give love, it almost always comes back. It doesn't might not come back if, right away. People might still growl for a bit. But if you, if you give it and you hand it to them, it gives the opportunity for them to be loving back. Now, this is a tough one. We know how tough it can be, mm -hmm. but that's the job. Better roll up our sleeves and you know, pay attention to it, I think. Yes. Truly. Thank you for this delicious moment. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be here with you, Lulu. Thank you so much for these lovely moments. Um, and we send you much love <laughs> from Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs>